The Gangut class was the first class of Russian dreadnought battleship and would develop the general layout that would be used in all subsequent Russian battleship classes that were actually built and completed. After Tsushima, the Russian Navy needed new ships, but confusion in the political spectrum meant they didn't actually know what they wanted until it was clear that the launch of Dreadnought meant that it was back to the drawing board. After they rejected a design bid from the UK due to various issues with that particular shipyard, and then they bought and shelved another design from an international competition that was held due to tensions between France and Germany, the contracts were finally awarded to a Russian shipbuilder who immediately went straight back to a British company for help developing the ship's hull profile and power plant. The design would then follow a fairly long and protracted course, which meant that whilst they were initially designed at the start of the second generation of Dreadnoughts, which, with which they would have been competitive, they were not completed until well into the second generation of Super Dreadnoughts. Four ships were ordered. The Gangut, Petropavlovsk, Sevastopol, and Poltava. The initial order was placed in 1909, but then the Russian parliament refused to actually pay for any of them for a couple of years, meaning they were only actually started in 1911. And as soon as they'd started, arguments immediately broke out over the type of boiler to use. If they used the larger, older type of boilers with lower pressure, maintenance would be easy, but the ships would be slow. The new high pressure boilers could give necessary power to keep the speed up, but were very maintenance intensive. Fed up with all the argumentation, the Russian Navy general staff simply packed a board with people who agreed with the new technology, got them to hold a vote, and that was over and done with. The ships would displace about 23,000 tonnes and had an absolute top speed of around 24 knots. They started entering service in 1914, but weren't really ready until 1915. The main battery consisted of a dozen excellent 12-inch guns in four triple turrets. Because it was thought that broadside firepower was significantly more important than end-on firepower, as well as the fact that the ships would have to deal with environments where lots of ice might build up on the ship, it was decided to forego super-firing turrets and instead have all of the main turrets in a linear formation at the main deck level. Whilst this made the ship very stable and dispersed the magazines, it also meant that there were magazines practically everywhere, including in the middle of the ship's machinery, and it also meant that the whole of the main deck was subject to blast effects from the main battery, which meant that they had to mount the secondary battery encasements one deck lower than would normally be done. As a result, the 16 4.7-inch guns had relatively limited arcs of fire and were pretty much useless in anything other than a flat calm. A single anti-aircraft gun and four torpedo tubes would complete the ship's total armament. The main belt, however, was quite thin at 8.9 inches thick. This was much less than any other contemporary battleship, and in fact thinner than a number of contemporary battle cruisers. And there was also no real torpedo protection, although this wasn't exactly unusual in ships of this period. The theory behind the main belt protection was that the belt armour would initiate the fuse on a heavy shell, which would then detonate just inside the belt, and then an inner splinter bulkhead would absorb any fragments and blast effects. The lighter weight of the system, in theory, allowed for more of the ship to be protected, but practically speaking, a heavy shell would probably just punch clean through both main belt and armoured bulkheads before detonating deep inside the ship, although it did provide the ships with an excellent degree of protection against potential high explosive rounds. Despite serving in the Baltic fleet, they never engaged the German fleet directly, and so the most ex exciting thing they ended up doing was occasionally running aground and having minor mutinies break out, followed by a major mutiny in March 1917, following the signing of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk and the subsequent outbreak of the Communist Revolution. The collapse of the Russian Empire saw the so-called Ice Voyage as they headed over from their base in what's now Helsinki to Kronstadt during a period when the Baltic was still largely frozen over, where lack of manpower put all but Petra Pavlovsk out of commission, and she was limited to largely shore bombardment duties against white Russian forces. Poltava ended up being damaged by a fire in 1919, and following a counter-revolution against the communists, both Sevastopol and Petropavlovsk were renamed to Paritskaya Komuna and Marat, respectively. The two undamaged ships would then be recommissioned in the mid-1920s, and all surviving vessels would be given proper revolutionary names. 
Poltava would be renamed Fruns, and they attempted to repair her damage, but money ran out before this could be completed, and she was eventually abandoned in 1935, after which she'd be used as a barrack ship and a source of spare parts for her sisters. Paritskaya Komuna was refitted in the late 1920s to improve her sea-keeping ability, then promptly ran into a massive storm in the Bay of Biscay and smashed in her bow. So not the world's most successful refit then. Marat would be the first one completely reconstructed in the early 1930s, with a brand new superstructure, brand new guns, overhauled turrets, some actual anti-aircraft armament, and new fire control equipment. She was also converted to oil fuel, producing enough power to allow some of the boilers to be removed and the space used for anti-aircraft ammunition and fire control spaces. The October Revolution, because forget trying to pronounce that in Russian, was the next one to undergo a refit. Her boilers were replaced outright with new boilers that had been intended for a Borodino-class battlecruiser, and the space saved on this particular ship was used to improve her underwater protection. Paraskaya Komuna would begin reconstruction in 1933, similar to her sister ships, with a number of subtle differences, with the guns and turrets being improved to increase their rate of fire and extend their firing range. She would also be the first ship to receive some light anti-aircraft guns. These alterations were all done by 1938, but she was back in the dockyard the next year to get even more upgrades in the form of increased deck protection and more anti-torpedo protection, which also helped to cure some stability problems, as well as greatly increasing underwater protection generally at a modest cost in speed. During the Winter War, they didn't do all that much other than attempt some shore bombardment before being driven off by near misses from the extensive Finnish coastal defences. But when the Germans attacked in World War II, Marat and October Revolution were forced to fall back to Kronstadt by the speed of the German advance. Both ships would fire on advancing German troops, with Marat being lightly damaged by return fire from German 5.9-inch guns, and then hit by two bombs that detonated her forward magazine, blowing her bow off, which was somewhat more inconvenient. She ended up sinking in shallow water, still being in harbour, but was eventually raised, or at least what was left of her, and used as a floating artillery battery for the rest of the war, using two, and after some work, three of her gun turrets. The October Revolution was badly damaged in September 1941 by three bomb hits that knocked out two of her turrets, and although she was repaired, she was hit by more bombs whilst under repair, which meant that she wasn't back out at sea until late 1942, at which point it was back to shore bombardment support. She would fire the last shots of a Soviet battleship shooting in anger in June 1944. Paritskaya Komuna had a much more charmed existence, not being hit by German bombs, but having to go back to get her worn-out guns relined by March 1942. By the time this work was finished, the Soviets were a bit nervous about exposing her to German air attacks again, given the fate of the other two ships, and the fact that at this point the Luftwaffe had also managed to pick off a number of theoretically much more manoeuvrable cruisers and destroyers. She returned to her original name of Sevastopol in 1943, and would lead remaining units of the Black Sea Fleet back to Sevastopol on the 5th of November 1944. Both Sevastopol and October Revolution would remain on the active list after the end of the war, although relatively little is known about what they actually did, thanks to, well, Soviets. They were reclassified as school battleships, i.e. training vessels, and eventually taken off the active list in 1956, although NATO recon revealed that October Revolution's Hulk was at least still around in 1958. There were several plans to rebuild Petra Pavlovsk, who'd also got her original name back, by stealing the bow of Fruns and moving the turrets around, but this was considered to be too expensive for a ship that was of relatively little value in the post-war environment, and these plans were dropped in the late 1940s. Instead, being renamed again to Volkov, she was used as a training ship until she was listed for scrapping in 1953, and broken up at some point thereafter. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.